Tonight's guest is Valerie Hoffman. Valerie is a full-time photography workshop leader and offers one-on-one customized classes for just about any subject that you might need help with. In tonight's presentation, slow it down and have some fun with long exposure. Valerie will emphasize the idea of slowing down and learning to see the world in slow motion. She'll talk about a creative thought process of how using slower shutter speeds can help you create some exciting and more compelling images that will wow your viewers. If you're on Instagram, look for her at Valerie Hoffman Photography, and you can connect with her through her website, ValerieHoffmanPhotography.com. Yay, Valerie, it's really nice to see you again. (laughs) <laughs> it's great to see you again, Linda. It's been a long time, right? <laughs> one day and that's then a, two weeks. <laughs> I know that's is, I know one day and two weeks. That's an inside joke. So Valerie um, is somebody that is kind of my. I don't know, Valerie. I think you hold the record of holding of of hosting, not hosting, uh, pro- providing us with presentations. Yeah. So I pull on you when I do the happiness hour. And, um, and I've pulled on you to do the photography circle presentations. And I thank you for that. I'm, you know, you and I met in 2018. I, you just had to remind me because I feel like I've known you forever. And um, you're somebody that when I do get to see, um, I don't get to see very often in person, but when I do get to see you and spend time with you, um, photography is fun. And I'm consider myself somebody that is always learning and um, it's kind of fun to be standing next to you and, and being able to ask you, Hey, what, what should I be doing? And you always, always have a good answer for me. And um, so that's one of the reasons I keep asking you to do presentations for me. So with that, um, anything you want to share? Cause you, I know you do workshops out of, uh, Pennsylvania. So, well, uh, cause we're small. So Pennsylvania, New Jersey, okay. Delaware, Maryland, um, hopefully up in New York as well. So yeah, I mix it up and, and actually I've done, you know, almost a week long one in the upper peninsula of Michigan and I'm looking forward to that Vegas one that, uh, you know, we're going to do. <laughs> so Yeah pretty good variety. So um, how can people, I know the answer because I get a newsletter from you. So how can people keep up with your newsletter, your offerings? Well, for one on social media, more on Facebook, that way there's an event created in Facebook for every event that's going on. Um, But you can just go to my website, which I'll have the information at the end here. And uh, because I'll offer you something as well if you go there, but um, you can right on the home page will be listed all the different events and private lessons as well. So I do do private lessons via Zoom. Um, And if you're in a different camera club or something in your area, like some Minnesota and that, I do do presentations, obviously, and and love to do it and love to meet people all over. So um, you can head over to the website when I give you that info. So unless Linda's typing it in or whatever. But, no, it should it actually it should be already be in there. So I'm way ahead of you tonight. All right. all right. Why don't you go ahead and start with your presentation? All right. So I'm going to keep it just without sharing for a second because I want to go through a couple things. So as we get started, I want to define the term slow um, as I'm defining it here tonight. So for our purposes um, tonight, I'm defining it as slower than the speed required to render a movement as normal. Okay, so anything that we can do to change what we would normally see with our eyes. Okay, and if you read kind of the description and everything, you know, we're going to talk about shutter speeds because that's how we would adjust this. And most of you realize that's how you would get a long exposure um, is by changing your shutter speed. And I know normally, especially if you're a landscape photographer, you probably are more focused on... um, you know, depth of field. So you're probably an average priority or just worrying about that. And shutter speed is usually the forgotten um, part of the, the exposure triangle. 
So that's where we're going to look at tonight and some of the creative things you can do, especially with slowing um, your shutter speed down. Now, I have a question for you guys also before we get started, and that is how many of you actually shoot in full auto or program mode where, where the camera is making the decisions for the shutter speed, aperture, or whatever? And there's no shame here. So, you know, if you're there... Um, that kind of leads into my very first slide. So type that in the chat if you like to use auto a lot with that. Okay, and I don't know if... I'm looking at... I'm okay. looking, I don't see Anyone? anybody. Maybe we're all manual. Yeah, We're all uh, pro-E people said it. All right, yeah. so the reason why I asked, and just to say, well, this would um, apply to your cell phones too, because you all use your cell phones when you do different things, even if you do a quick shot. So the majority of the time when you're in an automatic mode, your camera will choose a shutter speed that looks natural. And that is in a lot of cases, especially with one of my favorite things, which is water, it's probably one of the worst um, you know, ways to render a scene for as you know for creativeness or to be aesthetically pleasing so i'm going to switch over right now and start showing you some examples and get going here all right can everybody see my screen yeah it's good all right, I'm just going to keep it kind of this way so I can get at it. All right, so you're probably thinking, man, if this is the way all the pictures are going to look, this is really ugly. But I get that, and this is just to set a, a stage here. So first of all, what you're looking at is a stream. I'm in the Upper Peninsula in the fall, and the stream is completely in the shade. What you're seeing with the gold is the reflections from the sun hitting the trees on the bank. And then the blue is just the sky. And this was taken um, right at about a 1 25th of a second. In fact, that's why I like to keep um, this here. So actually a quarter of a second. And um, it's just not a pleasing look at all. Now... This, okay, that was just to set you up here. This is what your cell phone would take, or if you were in program, it would probably use, and you can check this if you look at your exposure settings, 1 25th of a second, 1 250th, maybe a 60th, depending on your light. And it's kind of rendering it the way our eye would see it. But if we start playing with the shutter speeds, and a way that you can do this is just go into shutter priority and let the camera, you know, set your aperture for you if you don't normally shoot in manual. But I'm going to give you a bunch of examples here of how it might look different as you change your shutter speed. And we're obviously going to get slower since that's what it's about. So this was at a 250th. This is at a 100th. Okay. This is a 60th of a second. And it's still real choppy, right? It's not very pretty. Okay, now we're at a 30th, and it's starting to look a little nice, I think. And then as we get slower, a 13th of a second. And I really love this. I started, and I was just waiting for someone to meet me, so I was just killing time playing with these different shutter speeds. And I didn't really know what I was going to get, but as I got slower here, I started really liking this. So it's soft. I'm getting this dreamy look in the colors, but I'm still getting a little bit of the, you know, the popping water there. And now as we got down to an eighth of a second, that's just really, you know, that looks real pretty to me. So, um, and then, okay, don't even mind the dust spots. This was, this camera that I had, which was the Canon 30D back in that day, you could get dust the second you turn it on without doing anything. And I've tried and it's horrible. So just ignore that. Um, I'm long past that. But here at a quarter of a second was where I think I just really started falling in love. And so while I was doing this, then I started changing around and doing different things. So again, 30th of a second, that's the highest I started with because I didn't like those fast shutter speeds. But now I'll keep an eye on it as we go down to 25th and slower and slower. And so right again, about a fifth is where it starts getting pretty. And then even softer yet. And this would probably be my favorite at about a quarterth. So I don't know if anybody, or this one at a full second. So I don't know if anyone um, has ever tried this. In fact, I'd like to know that. So maybe you do play with shutter speeds, but have you ever done this exercise where you do this series? Um, and last, last little set here, because I thought this was such a great example. Like this is one of my favorite um, spots here. 
just how it looked. And if you're doing this, like I challenge you to go out and try this on your own with some kind of moving water, but keep shooting because obviously as the waves move, you're going to get, you know, a different look to the scene. But this was the image behind me. This was what I love. This is what, um, in quoting John Barclay, was what made my heart sing. Like it was just really beautiful to me. And this is about the same shutter speed, so a fifth and a sixth. All right. Um, so, you know, look at, anybody know what this is? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that it's the been there at um, Niagara Falls. And that is a thundering waterfall, right? So, you know, this is what our eyes kind of see. This is a faster shutter speed, so you wouldn't even get that in any kind of automatic. But what if you slow it down? Now it took those gazillions of gallons that are thundering so loud that you can't hear and just made it this beautiful um, kind of peaceful um, water. And so just by your choice of shutter speed, which if I can remind you, and I wanted to say that in the beginning, you know, one of the most important things, best things that you could do is really understand the fundamentals of photography. Understand um, that shutter speeds and apertures, they're a creative tool for you to use. And, you know, it just depends on how you want to convey a scene. So doing, you know, keeping with water. So I have a bunch of different things that I use slow shutter speeds for. One of my favorite is absolutely water and waterfalls. And we are blessed, Debbie can tell you that we're blessed with a lot of waterfalls um, in Pennsylvania. And uh, this one was actually in Norway. But I find, and I've had people say, why does everybody shoot waterfalls, you know, slow and silky like that? I love it. Okay. I just think that's beautiful. Um, I don't like the way they look frozen unless I'm really trying to show something else off. Um, in this case, this, this is a little faster. This is a 30th of a second. And I was actually sitting on this bench waiting for this guy and this kid to get out of my picture of this waterfall in Oregon. And then when he stooped down to zip up his son's jacket, I knew that was like, that was a moment. And so I quickly just snapped and that's just kind of um, the shutter speed that I was at to not have them blurry, but again, just playing. Um, and I want to say too, the motion, um, what shutter speed you use, and I'm keeping that up so you can see all the different, you know, uh, shutter speeds that are, that I've used in these images, but the shutter speed that you use, it'll change depending on the motion. So again, the faster the motion, the faster the shutter speed could be to render something, you know, looking softer and slow. Um, here it was a sixth of a second. And I don't like this little bit of choppy look in the water, right? I would like it more smooth. Th that doesn't look natural. But a different angle from this falls. And here it's a longer exp um, shutter speed at a second. And now it's soft and um, continuously flowing. And it's beautiful. And then here's something that you could play around with as well. Um, you know, water mostly has, you know, you usually find some water bubbles on top and they can cause streaks when you're using longer um, exposures. So here we are on the Oregon coast and I'm standing in the water. And as the water recedes, using this little bit slower shutter speed gives you those lines as it goes out. And that gives some texture, some detail to the water that is far more interesting than just this kind of blob that you might get naturally. This one is maybe close to Debbie's house. This is Bushkill Falls. And again, those um, water bubbles are making these nice lines. This was a really long exposure um, at 61 seconds. Um, and I'll talk about gear but basically there is no special gear that you need for long exposure photography. I would say you need a tripod, right? Cause you're going to be slowing it down and you can't handhold. Uh, most of us can handhold below like a 15th of a second, maybe. Um, and then to go really long, you would probably want a neutral density filter. So I started with a polarizer here and that cuts two stops of light already. Um, you can, you know, if you're in after priority or whatever, you can go to F22 and that'll cut a ton more light. But I know that I also added, um, I believe, a six stop neutral density filter for this as well. So I could get a full minute and just loved the lines because doesn't that lead you through like you start at the waterfall and then these lines just lead you right through the image. 
Okay. Here I was with um, my friend Pam, and we were, this is the art museum in Philadelphia, and we um, went down so we could photograph at Boathouse Row. And I just set up a long exposure to get kind of the glow of the lights. And I wish I could say that I just knew I was going to get these leading lines here, you know, the, with this um, water. But it was just a nice surprise when I shot this at 20 seconds. And again, it kind of leads you through the frame because you go here and then almost come up and go to the museum. And this is Boathouse Row, if you've ever heard of it or ever been there. Um, it's a tr well, it's right there on the outskirts of Philadelphia on Kelly Drive. And it's just, um, they, it's lit up almost every night. I think they're working on the lights now, so it might not light yet. But here's the next thing about water. If you use a slower shutter speed than normal, which might be again, 60th or a second or whatever, you can now smooth out the water so that if you have something that's neat with reflections, then they'll be more mirrored and that can look pretty neat. So here's another example, Linda and I were in Vegas and I don't know, she didn't appreciate the neon as much as I did. And I'm not sure how much she liked the Bellagio fountain show, but I literally probably watched that several dozen times in the five days I was there. And while waiting for the next show to begin, you know, it's just extremely beautiful. Everything's lit up. So I did a longer exposure at six seconds here. And again, that totally smoothed out the water. And now you get these really cool reflections down there. Hello. Um, okay, so here's a waterfall scene. One of the things that you can look for, and I'll show you what you can do with this, is um, when you have this pool of water, watch and see if you see anything moving. So when I was standing here taking this picture, I started to notice that ever so slowly these leaves were moving in a slight rotation. Okay, and so knowing that, I like swirlies, so as they're nicknamed. So I like to create really cool swirlies if I can find that. So this was a 50 second exposure, again, with a neutral density filter um, to get that motion. You could probably start getting swirlies at about 10 seconds, but you may not get a full circle. Um, so the longer you leave the shutter open, the longer you can get that. So. If the question is to swirl or not to swirl, it's always a yes, let's swirl here. So just watch for leaves moving. And I've been known to throw leaves in there, so I actually have something more to swirl. Um, this is another one that was a minute long at Ricketts Glen, um, which, hey, if anybody wants to fly back to Pennsylvania, I've got a workshop coming up in a couple of weeks there because it's so cool. It's like 23 waterfalls. Now, another thing that you can do, so you looked at about a quarter of a second as my norm, a half a second, maybe down to one second for the normal with the water, because that keeps some texture and detail. But I also like to play while I'm there and standing in the stream and, you know, set up with doing really long exposures just so the waterfall and give it that ghosty kind of dreamy look. So this one was at 30 seconds. And you see, there's really no detail in the water, but it's just kind of neat, I think. So you can tell me, do you like the ones with a little more texture or do you like the super long, dreamy, you know, look like right here? And again, I can go back to full unless somebody wants to ask, um, you know, what a shutter speed was. Oh, you're good. Okay. So this is uh, Great Falls National Park um, outside of D.C. This is the Potomac where it drops like 100 feet. And again, I noticed... Um, and this was a little before sunrise, this, you know, the foam was just moving around. And my first pictures that I had was just really ugly blobs of foam there. And so I slowed it down um, to a really long shutter speed. And there, you know, you have this neat swirl. And then just say you're not near waterfalls, but you have a lake. Again, you can just really smooth out the water. And if you get a beautiful um, sunset, or sunrise, um, you know, you can get this beautiful mirrored reflection. And if I'm going to go out to shoot sunrise or sunset, I will usually try and be by water so I can get something like this. Here's an image where it was maybe at, I think it was an eighth of a second or so. So you can see a little bit of the water, the waves moving around, and then totally giving it, you know, like a minute exposure. 
and smoothing it out. Down at the ocean, or I'm sorry, Christy, down the shore, if she's here. So this was, um, I want to pull this back up. Oops. Hang on. Um, this was a six. What's is that? that the Jersey Shore? Is this the Jersey Shore? Dan Jersey Shore. I don't think they say that in, in Maryland or Delaware. <laughs> so down the shore is what the Jersey people say. So, yeah, this was a minute long exposure as the waves were coming in um, just after sunset, almost blue hour. And here was another one. This was actually a sunrise, I think. Let's see. Yes. 539. See, I do get up early sometimes. Um, but this was 155 seconds of just letting it run and getting that really neat ethereal look. And then, so I don't have my Michigan friends here, but this was um, up by one of the lighthouses there. And, you know, it, the way, it was really windy. We had a workshop and it was crashing. And so this 1.6 seconds just really smoothed it out. And you can see that turquoise so much better. Um, another a quick example, because I think most of what we do is, you know, long exposures with water, because other subjects might tend to blur out so much that you can't even make them out. But this is water, about one second, just trying to play around at a lame sunset. And then I set up to do a really long, again, a minute long. And look at the difference in the water there. It's just really beautiful. And just the same thing. All right, so next thing that is really fun to do with um, long exposure photography is to photograph moving clouds. So obviously you need a windy day and your best results will be when the uh, clouds are coming towards you or maybe even away. So here I was shooting that sunset that you saw earlier and doing this long exposure as a, you know, it was really picking up. So 20 seconds and now you can see the motion in the clouds and in the water. So you've lost your, your mirrored reflection, but it's kind of neat. And same with here. This, once I saw the clouds moving, then I moved it to a 50 second exposure. Now, some of your cameras can only go down to 30 seconds. That used to be the norm. Um, a lot of the newer mirrorless might go down to 60 seconds, so you might want to check that. If you want to go longer exposures and you don't automatically have that, like your shutter speeds end at 30 or 60 seconds, then you can put the camera in bulb mode, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and just leave it open as long as you like. But there you'll be guessing at your exposure. So here's another nice mix with, and this is Maryland, um, you know, moving clouds and the ghosting water, which can be really pretty, I think. Um, some clouds, and here's here's a tip too with clouds. If it's a really kind of overcast day, here we came, I was meeting uh, Trish from Texas, and we were going to shoot the sunset. And if you look here, the clouds came in and totally squished it out. You see just that little line. So we had this sky and it was really windy. So at one second, it's just kind of soft clouds, but at 15 seconds, they're just kind of, you know, starting to move around. But it's not as obvious, you know, when it goes really long, like 20 seconds, because it's kind of a white sky. So you have to watch and don't go too long. You know, again, just playing with different shutter speeds. Here's another one, just looking up at a fire tower here in Reading. It could be kind of neat. So that's just a very different perspective with moving clouds. And you can let me know if you've, you know, shot moving clouds or you like to do really slow motion water or whatever. Um, so now here's something a little different. We have clouds. I'll talk about stars, but I was doing a long exposure here um, for star trails and these clouds, it wasn't a cloudy sky, but they started streaking. And so however many minutes 2,089 seconds is, um, that's how long this exposure went and the clouds just were creating a blur there. And then amusement rides. I love playing with amusement rides. So here's just something um, 
you know, most places will actually let you use a tripod too. So these were all with a tripod. Um, in order to freeze this ride, you'd probably need a 500th or an 800th of a second at least. So I shot it down at a sixth of a second just to show that, you know, that it's blurred and in motion. And then you can also add a little camera movement. So I zoomed during a long exposure and got an even kind of cooler effect. Now, while you're at a fair, you might find some little rubber duckies floating around in there. So I walked up to this and saw these little duckies moving around. I thought, well, what can I do creative? So I photographed them at a sixth of a second and I liked, you know, just that little blur. So it looks like they're just speeding along um, past you, but uh, they're really just floating slow. But as I went down, so these were at like a third of a second, but then I thought, I'm just gonna see what the heck, see what happens if I do an eight second exposure. And look, you just have, you know, a yellow streak going around. So it's just, you know, what I try to aim at with my images is to do something different and more creative and to stop somebody in their tracks. So they say, well, what is going on here? Um, and that's, you know, just a little something you might want to try too. So amusement rides continuing there. You know, if you're asking what shutter speed should I go for or where should I start with amusement rides or any kind of action, you want your shutter speed to be as long as it takes for the ride to do like a complete motion if it's something that goes in a circle. So here my shot at 13 seconds wasn't long enough for, you know, to catch the entire circle that came from this ride. But here, and I think part of that too was they stopped it to keep reloading. So if you're shooting amusement rides, you want to wait till they're going to be in motion for their minute or two. But here is really what you wanted was this nice, looks like spirograph, um, which you create just by a long exposure. Ferris wheels are great subjects um, to get that. And if they're really spinning like this one, you could do it pretty quick, like two seconds. Um, another little tip, if you're doing, um, you know, any kind of amusement rides, a lot of times they have changing lights, you know, they might be blue and then green. So you want to try and keep your shutter speed, just the duration of each color, and then just keep snapping away. So a couple more here. And really anything in motion is fair game and just play around with your different shutter speeds. I thought this started looking like a butterfly. And it just is a ton of fun. This is that ride. I guess we call it the Zodiac here where people are pinned against the thing and, you know, where you spin around until you want to throw up. So, but it's pretty cool. Um, looks like just a top with all the lights. Now, bonus, if you can get two rides together in the same frame in motion. So when I'm composing, I'll try and, you know, get an angle where I might have a couple rides going. And then an even bigger bonus is if you can get rides in motion and fireworks. So if I'm going to go to a fair and fireworks is an option, then I will always go on that night because I like to play even more. Now, the downfall is you normally don't have all your rides spinning at the same time, which can be very frustrating, or they both start spinning and then there's no fireworks burst. So it just takes a little patience and practice. And then fireworks, especially if you follow me, where I'm one week away from fireworks starting a block away from my house for the Reading Phillies, I love to photograph fireworks. And I think fireworks looks more compelling, maybe if I say, if you have more than one burst in the image. So here you can count them. There's a ton of images in here. And so for doing fireworks, the best way to do that, obviously be on a tripod, be in the bulb setting, um, pre-focus on something like here, this pagoda at the top of our mountain, and then put it in manual focus, and then use your cable release and just leave the shutter open for at least three bursts. This was getting ready for a finale, and so all these kind of went off almost together. But um, 
you know, just leave it open for longer. If it's if there's time in between your bursts, you could cover the front of your lens gently with a hat so you're not overexposing, say, the pagoda or something else you might have in the foreground. But I think it's just, you know, kind of neat if you can get multiple bursts in there. So that's those. And then this is fire spinning. Um, I don't know if everybody's heard of that. Maybe you could tell us in the chat whether you have, whether you've ever tried it. So from the first time I saw it, I thought, this is really cool and I want to do this. And I, I don't know, is Christy on here? So mm -hmm. every time every time I go over to New Jersey, like I take my steel wool and we want to do something. But we have yet to figure out where we won't set fire to something where we won't get arrested or highly fined for spinning um, and it's steel wool spinning or where we won't be in a very visible area where somebody might see it as they're driving by and crash. So um, I haven't found that yet, but I'm going on another. This is a workshop that I paid to attend. And instead of the normal little whisk in the little um uh, yeah, steel wool that's inside that you spin. They have this huge basket and it spins and it the, the sparks shoot like 40 feet. Um, this is at a burned out building at a fire training center with firemen standing by. So it's about as safe as you can get. Um, and they send us a whole list of what clothing not to wear and even don't put hairspray on so you don't catch fire. So, but it can be really cool. So if you've never heard of it, Google it, you'll see a bunch of inspirational um, images, and then maybe you'll even find a place to try it without, you know, getting in trouble. So another really fun thing to do for long exposures is car trails. So here we are back in Vegas on the strip and this eighth of a second um, isn't complete trails, but you're starting to see a little motion um, and that just adds something to your cityscapes. Here, this is a much longer exposure. So this is five full seconds. And I'm standing, I'm using a fisheye lens. That's why you have this curve. And I'm looking over at the Eiffel Tower. And all these like streaks are cars coming and going. And even the higher ones are a bus going by. And it's just pretty fun. It just really can add to the image. Um, here, I'm standing in the middle of the street in Philadelphia and getting cars coming and going. Here's another tip. If you want to go out and try um, getting car trail lights, don't do it in a place where there's a traffic light every block because you'll just be waiting forever for the traffic to go and then it'll stop and it's even worse than amusement rides. But it's really cool when you can get your streaks. This was a 30 second exposure, which outlasted several lights. Um, and then here in a different one they had, this was at Christmas and they had a Ferris wheel. So I thought that would be fun to try and incorporate that. But again, both lights weren't going at the same time. I got nothing over here. I wanted traffic lights. So wait around some more and now you can get them coming and going. I am standing in a median and not in the road. I'm crazy, but not completely stupid. Um, and this is a Pennsylvania State Capitol, and this is standing across on Main Street. And again, there's just your car trails um, as they're streaking by right in front. And again, 13 seconds is what it took to get slow moving traffic recorded in there. Now, Texas people, you should know what this is, right? So this is the world famous river walk, and there are these boats. And uh Trish, who I don't know if she's here, but she and I went to San Antonio on my visit a couple of years ago to Texas, and we wanted to photograph this. So here's your basic cell phone, boring shot, and there it took it at a 30th of a second. It is not going to win any awards. But if I start slowing it down, um, so now at a third of a second, you can see the motion, right? You can see motion in the boat, and you can see motion in the people there. But that's not what I wanted. So we really wanted the after dark shots um, because all the boats light up. So now as we're in the blue hour, and this is just a two and a half second, now we're starting to see streaks from the boat lights. Well, this is a boring picture. This isn't really what I was hoping for. So, you know, okay, made it a little longer. Now it's 10 seconds, but it still isn't kind of what I'm hoping for. 
So now I'm leaving the lens open really long. And this is a little side thing for Olympus shooters. So if you're anybody but Olympus, you would need to leave um, it, to get the images you're going to see in the next couple of seconds. Um, you probably need to have a 30 second at least exposure. But in live composite in Olympus, you can um, it'll just keep recording the light without blowing out. Um, the existing light. So only new light will be recorded. So I just kept leaving the shutter open and I could see what I was getting. And I just loved all these different colors. Each boat has a different color. So you get the green and the purple and the red streaks, which is pretty fun. And just kind of waiting for a bunch of boats to go through, hoping they just keep moving. So it's just pretty fun. And then I think this was my favorite where I just really left it open for a long time. And I saw some kid going with, you know, whatever little lights that they were selling. I thought, oh, now he's going to wreck my image. But now that I see it, like, I think this looks really cool, too, as <clears throat> too, as he's just walking up there with these lights. So this was one of my favorite little things. And again, that's all just the motion of the boat lights over a long exposure. What other things you can do? You can do it with trains. So this is the um, train set at Longwood Gardens at Christmas. So slow it down, third of a second. This is Linda. I don't know if you saw this. So this was when I was just out there and um, our friend Elaine took me around and we were photographing these giant boots. And this boot was at a pet store of some kind. And it had a dog coming out the top of the boot. And we noticed that his ears were like propellers. They moved. And so, all right, let's show that there actually is some motion and used a long exposure. Now, in full disclosure, my escort, Elaine, spun the ears for me so I could get a little bit of motion. How about a musical instrument? So here I use longer exposure for guitar. Because if you use, you know, just a regular speed like you might normally get with a cell phone, you won't, it'll just seem like the person's sitting there, right? Not strumming. And how about people? How about runners? So um, slower shutter speed, it shows their legs in motion. Which can be pretty fun. And then back at your fair, so you can set up and get all the people wandering back and forth, waiting in line for their cotton candy. But as they move, you see just these little sets of legs, which is kind of creepy or fun, depending on which way you think about it. And, and then, you know, well, birds. So I don't photograph a lot of birds. I'm becoming more of a birder. I guess that's now been recorded. But... On this night, I was shooting a super moon with some friends, and it actually was pretty dark, and my eyes were adjusted for the brightness of the moon coming up. And we were at a place that has a lot of migratory birds. So this was in February, and we get snow geese. And, you know, the sky was pretty much black, but the lady aside of us, who was just wondering why we were all here with cameras, um, said, here come birds, because we wanted to get some in front of the moon. And she said, fire. And so I just started shooting, and I was at a way slow shutter speed, a sixth of a second. But when I looked at it, I thought, well, that's kind of cool. It almost looks like bats, doesn't it? So this wasn't intended to happen, but I thought it was kind of cool. But this one was intended to happen. So these are the snow geese taking off. And I want to give a shout out to um, Denise Ippolito because I've seen, you know, I she used to do this technique and I thought it was pretty cool looking. So if you're going to get blurry birds, like, yeah, let's make them really blurry and artistic looking. You can get a motorcycle in motion. And it's neat when you have everything else still and just like one thing in motion. And uh, this, so we have a track that's pro bicycle racing and even, you know, Olympic champions come and train here. This is all summer. And so I lead a workshop here usually once a year and it's all about shutter speed as we're talking about. And so here, you know, we're using a slow shutter speed, which they're flying. And so it just at 30th of a second just causes them to be a blur. And here's one of the participants shooting them um, as they're going by which kind of adds to it. So just a couple more of those. All different shutter speeds, play around. Here I threw a flash on too, so that I'd get some little reflection and pop. 
So again, that's showing that there's a race kind of happening and in action. And then kind of along the same lines, I don't know, has anyone here ever tried panning? So panning is a technique where you're you're moving the camera with the subject's motion and you're using a slower shutter speed, which will, um, you know, if you're moving with the subject, then they should stay in sharp focus, but everything else in the background will be blurry. And that's another way to render your motion pretty neat. So normally you would have to shoot this at about an 800th of a second to try and freeze those riders. But here at a 30th, I'm shooting as I'm following the action and you can get some neat um, images that way. So you see the softness in the background here, just this guy in the front, he was the one I was focused on in shooting. Same here in a straightaway. So I think that's a pretty neat effect. It's pretty tricky to do. Like if you've never tried it, you need to. It's kind of crazy, um, but it's really fun when you get it to work. Say you have a motorcycle or you have a friend as a motorcycle. That's a really fun thing to do some panning on. This is my webmaster in action. And then how about horses? So you guys have horses, right, in Texas? So doing some panning of a rider riding in front of us. Um, here's one at an 80th of a second. And then this one at a 20th is even softer. So again, different shutters. So this one kind of is freezing the horse. And this is just much more soft with the legs. And I just think that's real artistic looking. And then remember when merry-go-rounds were on playgrounds, you know, and we all fell off them or whatever, and we lived to tell about it. But um, I think you can't even find them anymore. But on this day, I did kind of panning in a different way where I sat opposite my nieces and nephew and grandma spun the merry-go-round for us. And because I was um, with them on the ride, they're mostly sharp or falling off, and then you have the blur around the background, which I think is pretty cool. And then another thing we can do with long exposures, you know, Linda's had these on the happiness hour several times, but um, intentional camera movement. So we need a longer exposure than normal so that we can do stuff with the camera in motion. So this is an image, it's actually a multiple exposure, but you could do this almost handheld, is just moving the camera around this flower and you're getting this sort of stagger step. If you can do it on a tripod, it's better to kind of keep yourself centered. Here is a, a lens that had a tripod collar and so, you know, just doing a little bit longer exposure and spinning that um, gave me this circular blur. And then also with your longer exposures, you can do some swipes, which give you this sort of painterly look of the bamboo. And you can, I just kind of tapped my camera and gave it this little bit jagged look. And again, if you were just at a regular shutter speed, like you would never see the action. You might see just a weird blur but you can do some neat things. So I just kind of swiggled, swiveled, swooshed. And then here's some holiday lights where I'm just completely spinning the camera around in a circle and, you know, getting this kind of light painted look. And the same with this one. So ICM, you could go on and on with a bunch of different things, but that's a pretty fun thing to do and slowing your camera down. And then star images okay so that's where long exposures would come in and you know you're really not going to see stars until you open up the lens a longer amount of time and i don't know i forget what this even is but it was pretty cool i mean it looks like a ufo but um so on average if you want sharp stars or milky way which we had a great presentation last night on the happiness hour with milky way photography you're probably going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 seconds depending on your lens and in this case having that longer exposure brought out the northern lights that were shining that night that was the reason we were actually at this lighthouse and these northern lights were not visible at all to the naked eye but the camera sensor was picking them up at the higher iso so you can get northern lights, you can get sharp stars, you can get your Milky Way, you can get lots of plane trails that you can pretend are comets. <laughs> a 
which you hope they're comments, but those weren't. And then slowing it down way more, you can get star trails. So if you're pointing at the North Star, you'll get this nice um, concentric circle. You can do this one of two ways, three ways. So you can either leave the lens open for at least an hour to two or three hours and get the motion, which is in other stars we're actually moving. But, um, or you can do, so the problem is if something flashes, if something happens in the image to ruin it, then your whole three hours is wasted. But if you do individual exposures, so this would be like a series of 30 second exposures, but still over an hour or two, then you could um, merge those together in software. Or you could do like Olympus users and use live composite and just let the camera run and you'll be able to see this build. And it's fun, too, if you can get stars over water. So here's another one. This was a series, or this was a live composite shot where a long exposure, just letting it run. And then this was individual shots, um, not facing north, that were, I don't even remember, this was probably like over the course of an hour and a half. And then these were all merged together in software to give you those star trails. Again, those are plane trails. I was working on them and gave up. I'll go back to it when I have time to try and get them out in Photoshop. Um, this is down the shore again in Jersey. There's this World War II bunker on the that's just left on the beach there and it's pretty cool looking and that orange light is just the mercury vapor lights from the parking lot i don't know maybe a quarter mile away so it's kind of lighting it up and then just you know even with light pollution you can still get some stars which can be kind of cool and then summertime like i don't know do you guys have fireflies there in texas or is it just too hot and they melt they like hot and humid conditions um we have a ton of them like you'll see them mostly for the month of june maybe into july um so they love to be out on hot humid nights so um at least a couple times i'll go out to somewhere where it's reasonably dark and try and get so that's all these little all these little blips or fireflies flying around um, my friend Ginny and I actually went to this area with these three crosses and we wanted to get the star trails over it. So here I have star trails and the fireflies going on. And I have one, can I, can I tell a funny story, Linda? Of course. This is one of my, this is one of my funniest, most costly shots I've ever taken. So not this. So after I got laid off from Ritz, where I worked all my life, um, I had free time. And so in Hocking Hills, Ohio, every year they had um, this contest called Shoot the Hills. And it was a 24-hour photo contest. And it had some pretty cool prizes. So this year I went and my friend Brian and I, we were scouting and we were going to do light painting of this waterfall at night. We thought that was so cool. So here's the test shot. What's it going to look like? I'm standing like in a half an inch of water. And so this is the scene. So then we come back that night and we're fully geared with headlamps and all these kind of lamps. And so two cameras are set up in this little on the rocks in the stream. And he's down front with this light that's blue and he's just painting the water. So, you know, because it's totally dark, like you can't see anything. I couldn't see him. He couldn't see me. And then I have a big spotlight that I'm changing between an orange and a red um, gel and I'm lighting up the rocks. And on the way down the steps, I said to him, you know, I tend to be a cop magnet in this kind of situation. And sure enough, just as we figured out a good exposure for our light painting, I hear this voice and I see this flashlight come at me and somebody's yelling that you're not allowed in the park at night. Well, there was no gay dude. Who knew? And so what you're going to start to see here, you see a little bit of motion, but now here, and it's a state trooper, he's now in the scene with his flashlight, trying to shine down and get my friend's attention who can't hear because he's by a waterfall making noise. Um, so you see the state trooper wandering around and then there he is. And Brian's looking back at me like, why did you stop painting? And this was the last shot that was taken before we were issued our $180 citations each for three offenses 
for being in the park at night, being off the trail. And I don't know what, be, being from Michigan in Ohio, I don't know. So that's my funny long exposure light painting story um, and kind of everything I have here. So here's, here's some information. So this is where you can, I guess it's already in the chat, but um, I try and post every day um, on Instagram. Um, I'm horrible at reels or stories, as Linda can tell you. So I'm sorry, I'll get better at that eventually. Um, Facebook, I post, you know, whenever I go to shoot somewhere. And then here's the website. And so as a little gift for, you know, who's ever here, um, if you would like a copy of my notes that have some shooting detail and everything, there's a little bit of detail on the panning and star trails and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you would like a copy of that, you could just go and, and sign up for my newsletter. Um, I only put that out like once a month and um, then just send me a note through the contact thing and I'll send you the the notes there. Um, so I think that was all the details. So um, hey. stop share. any good questions? Actually, the questions that were coming up, you answered as you like the next slide you so you covered all the questions that I that that I saw. If anybody has anything else, go ahead and put those in the chat real quick. Um, <clears throat> so I, let's talk about steel wool spinning. Ah, oh, that's one of my favorite things to do. And it, you know, it's, we're, it's, we're in Texas, we're flammable. Everything's dry here. There's not a lot of water, but I had an opportunity and this is my tip to you guys, get on Instagram, make, make friends. And I made some friends with these two young kids and I'm not, they were young gentlemen, but they were putting out the coolest steel wool um, shots. And I'm just, you know, I just said, Hey, this is crazy. You know, would you take an old lady out? And they took me out. And um, so we got really lucky you know, they live at the coastline. So we were able to, to do that near the water. So we were completely, you know, safe. And it was really cool to get reflections right on the sand, you know, where the water would recede. It was really, it's one of my favorite things, but um, you're right. It's, it's kind of a, it's a hard thing to do outside of a workshop, unless you have you know, you, you have a really safe place to do. So right. y'all be careful trying to do it. Um, Can oh. I just add to that? I would love, so I'm glad you said water. Like that's where I would really love to do it. If you can do it in a shallow, like even mm -hmm. a parking lot that after it rained, you know, cause you'll see those reflections and the water, you'll see the, them bounce up and reflecting and yeah. it's safer and it's neater. Yeah. So if you have any shallow water or something you can fill, that would be a great place to go. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Debbie is, um, let me finish Christy's thought here. She says we could probably get some steel wool in her pasture on a really, uh, well, slightly damp day. So you want to set fire to her house. Yeah, you really, her you really don't know. Let's go get in trouble at a state park. Yeah. Go to, go to the shore. Can you go to the shore somewhere? Okay. So, um, Debbie's question is, do you have any suggestions for getting started, um, in phot photographing scenes at night with lights? She's tried a few times, but she's had a hard time being able to focus on something and she's never been able to get a photo that she likes. What's our subject? Like, what do we mean? Are we city lights or what, like what specifically? Are well, we I don't, about? She hasn't given, uh, she hasn't mentioned that. Let's see if she'll type really fast. Yeah, Debbie, tell us what you. Yeah. What are you most... She's like building near buildings near a dock. Okay. So the best thing for night photography is to shoot that at blue hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after the sun is set and after the color's gone, the sky is blue for a little bit until it goes to um, astronomical twilight, which is total darkness. And at that point where the sky is blue, you know, so it's almost dark, your, your city lights generally will be balanced with the blue light and you can almost always get a good exposure right then but I would just start in manual um, full manual I would be at whatever aperture you think you need for your depth of field and then just start at whatever the camera might say or a little more light than that you know worth your meter reading and then just keep opening up to you see detail where you want detail and then if you have say a dock or something that doesn't have any light on it 
um, you know, like for that bunker, we went with that military bunker on the beach. We went with some lights and we were going to light paint it so that you could see it. Otherwise, if you're in the dark, it would have been invisible. But after our first test shot, we realized the parking lot lights, you know, because it was long enough exposure, we're doing that. So if you have, there might be enough ambient light even to light up everything. Um, but it's just, you know, keep trying slower and slower shutter speeds till you're getting detail. Okay. I hope that helps. Yeah, it, I think it did. Um, yeah. So we just have to get Debbie out there. Um, all right. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, oh, wait a minute. She says, I think my problem was it was already too dark outside. Yeah. Blue Bower would be your friend. I would. You can, I mean, you can, like I've done cityscapes at 30 seconds and one minute, you know, to let enough light in. So you could just try to go longer exposures. Yeah. That's a good point. But if it's dark, dark, you're not going to get it, right? You need some light. So you could try light painting your buildings, um, you, you know, something like that. You have to add light if it's totally dark. Okay. Well, Valerie, another um, home run for you. This was a great presentation. You know, um, my favorite of this, of the, of this type of photography is going to be the water. I can, yeah. I think you and I could plan ourselves and never leave if we just had the right piece of water and with good coloring from the sky that reflects, you know, like the one that's on the screen behind you. I, we could have spent hours and hours and hours with oh, that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just a very like the, the picture at the shore with the waves and everything. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very ethereal look. And I just looking down. So neutral density filters. I don't know if everyone has them. Um, if you don't have any and you want to get started, I would start with at least a six stop neutral density. Um, you can get a lot of people when you see those really neat, um, like the ocean shots are done with a uh, 10 stop, like a more slow um, and you can, I just get like KNF concept that are $30, $40 versus, you know, the big names that are a hundred some, but the other thing, so we just had an eclipse that everybody in the world went out and bought all these filters for that you probably didn't even use if you were in Texas because you couldn't freaking see the sun anyway. Um, but so if you have these 16 stop filters, I'm going to try that at water. I'm going to keep carrying that with me. And the other thing that's cool, which I didn't have, I don't have any examples, but say you're in a crowded area, like I've seen pictures in, you know, Russia or Basilica or something, and you got all these people wandering around and you don't want them in the image. If you use one of these really long um, exposures, you know, with these neutral densities, people will walk out of the scene and completely disappear. So that's a pretty good thing. You could do that in a shopping area or whatever. It could be pretty cool. So don't Try and sell your 16 stop or, you know, pack it away till the next the eclipse, but try that. You will have to, your camera will not read the light through that. It'll probably read up to maybe a six, six stop, but otherwise you're going to have to use one of those calculators, which photo pills has to tell you how long to make your exposure. If that helps. Yeah. Diana put a, 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 a helpful tip is um, go earlier to get a focus lock and then turn off your autofocus on the lens and then Absolutely. don't touch that camera. So she uh, recommends using a shutter release to click that image. Do you use a shutter release? Yes. Yeah, you... I said it in a couple, like for the fireworks, I'm always using a cable release. Okay. And my preference is the cabled one and not an infrared one, because there's usually a little delay. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, I just have that. And like for star trails and that, you can even lock them open and let it run um, or set a timer on it. So, yeah. Okay. I do. Well, Valerie, again, thank you very much for, you know, adding some great content to the channel. So I so appreciate you coming and, and, um, um, just being willing to do another presentation for me. 